Good afternoon to all the audience who are watching us from Facebook and YouTube live stream. Welcome to 40th online series from Kuala Lumpur and Slango Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kalsiki. I'm Bhuvna, the host for today's session. I would like to request, please do share this live to your social media walls so that we can reach out to as many as SMEs in Malaysia. So today's topic is all about awareness on IoT adaptation for SMEs and business intelligence. The general idea of IoT involves in direct communications of smart devices, or we call this as the IoT devices, includes wireless sensors, softwares, computer devices, which attach to a particular object, where it operates through internet, enabling the transfer of data among the objects or people automatically without a human interventions. And we can shortly call this as automations and connectivity for the industrial 4.0 revolution era. Before I introduce our special speaker for today, I would like to call upon Mr. Kumaraguru, the Honorable Treasurer of Kalsiki, to give his opening speech. Over to you, Mr. Guru. Thank you so much, you so much. Ms. Bona. Thank you so much. Uh, very good afternoon to our Kalsiki ESCO members, our council members, and our esteemed members, Kalsiki esteemed members, and our visitors, and also our uh, today's guest speaker, Dr. Mazran Abbas who's an IoT expert and also uh, CEO of the favorite company, all right? And this is our 40th series. We already reached our almost 40th. So it's a big victory for Kalsiki. And uh, our topic for today is IoT adaptions for SME business and business intelligence as we call uh, IR 4.0. And everybody knows IoT, Internet of, the, uh, Internet of Things is one of the vital and important role playing in the business areas. And as well, nowadays, they, even the house also using IoT. You talk about Google Home and those kind of devices, most of the devices, even air condition, everything been uh, air conditions, lighting, smart systems, everything been uh, hooked up with uh, Google Home as well. For information, I'm, I'm running my own business on the construction and renovation. We also running a uh, security systems and IT infrastructure cabling work. So a lot of people in the business world, uh, IoT has become a necessity. And I can see how important uh, the IoT is and how to minimize the human capital and increase more in the technology. People have that kind of awareness. And a lot of officers, trust me, about 20, 30 years ago, without facts, we're not running an office. They call not consider office now. Fax is already evaporated. Nobody using a fax. I think about only about five percent in the market people are using a fax, and everybody is going to use internet. Without internet in the office, doesn't mean you're not running a business. Those kind of things, you know. So that's it's important on the internet, internet of things, and people call us IIoT also in the industrial area, whereby industrial internet of things, another one called IoT, internet of things. Most of the SME businesses. And I believe uh, security systems like a CCTV, like a face recognition, everything included, everything become in one technology. So whereby people can use those kind of IOTs and security part also is very important and cloud. And it's amazing. Last time we are buying a, even accounting software and we need to install one by one computers and all of those. Nowadays, people are using a cloud basis accounting software. See, we are, because a lot of people after this pandemic, the, we are running the business in the different different uh, modus operandi. You know why? Because of now you can work from home, and and a lot of uh, a lot of costs can be cut down. As a, as a boss, how to increase the efficiency? How to minimize the cost is important. So cloud and IoT playing important role. I, I recently I read about uh, cloud basis uh, under Oracle. They come up with NetSuite. NetSuite is one of the Oracle cloud bases. They started cloud talking about 2000, uh, 2002. Almost 20 years they were using cloud bases. And, and, and this year, second fiscal of year, they make money almost about 9 billion sales. So you see the huge uh, potential on the cloud and IoT, how people are using it. And without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Maslan to, uh, to share about his expert on IoT and how to our, our, our chamber people, our, 
our members can benefit out of it, how they can apply in their businesses. And as what we know, our Indian people, our Indian business owner, most of the people, 70 to 80 percent people are in the service industries. So those kind of industries, how this IoT, Internet of Things, can apply and can efficiently can do business globally, not only locally, globally. Okay, thanks, Buona. You can carry on on that. Thank you. Thank you, Guru. Thank you so much for the welcoming speech. Uh, so without further ado, now it's time for us to welcome our proudly honorable guest speaker for today, Dr. Maslan Abbas, the CEO and the co-founder of Favorite, the IoT man of Malaysia, who has also made us to be proud with his position as the 50th most impactful smart cities leaders by World CSR 2017. Being profound thought leader and influencer in IoT area, Dr. Maslan has more than 30 years of experience and accomplishment in senior management capacity in Red Tone, IoT, MIMOS, Cellcom, and UTM. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Mr. Uh, Maslan Abbas to present on the brief of IoT and how SMEs can be benefited on this fast-moving Industry 4.0 era. Over to you, Doctor. Okay, thank you very much, Abhuvna. Thank you, Mr. Kumara Guru, uh, for the uh, introduction. And uh, it's a well uh, described about the Internet of Things. And I think, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to KL Sikhit for uh, inviting me to this particular session. Uh, I'm sure that you have heard and listened a lot more about this technology for, for quite some time since the, uh, the early days when we mentioned about the Internet of Things in 2014, as early as 2014. Uh, that was the days when we are talking about the National IoT Strategic Framework. Okay. Uh, the, the idea for, for uh, the for the presentation today is about, you know, giving that kind of more awareness to all of the SMEs. I'm sure that you, you have heard about it, but you're just not sure of how to start uh, and to begin your journey in uh, doing this Internet of Things. Uh, one of the things that I've always insist that in, in our country, we should be looking towards more about having uh, what we call uh, this, con you know, the, the idea of consumer versus producer kind of nation. Uh, if you remember, I think most of the time when we implement things, we consume a lot of things and the technologies and the products that we have developed uh, actually, it's, it's not uh, sometimes more that most of the time it belongs to other other people or other countries, which I believe is not uh, fair for the people who are the SMEs who are actually building the solutions in house. So we like to have more and more uh, uh, initiatives and uh, you know uh, purchases or procurements from our local uh, users to purchase from our local industry. So this idea of consumer versus producer nation, we have been, it has been a big problem when we become a consumer nation. You know, we, we are not grooming and we are not growing our own internal uh, capability. Yeah, we are not supporting our local industry. We have talked, we have been talking about made in Malaysia thing. We would like to buy our own Malaysia, but yet most of the time when technology uh, want to, we want to implement any new technologies, it will come from overseas. So it's, it's, it's a big problem. What we want is to be, become a producer nation whereby uh, the talents that we're going to have, you know, to get from all our uh, graduates from the local universities, they, their talents should be fully utilized rather than become a, just a consumer. You buy things, you don't need, you know, very innovative mind or creative mind because uh, to become a producer nation, you need that kind of people. By having this kind of people, yet yeah, then you can develop your own products. Yeah, so we, we should be proud of doing that. Uh, this roadmap or this uh, IoT uh, initiative have been, we have started very much early, not two years back, not four years back. It was nearly seven years ago, two thousand fourteen, and during that time, uh, when we launched this national IoT strategy roadmap, the idea is that first. We want to create that IoT ecosystem, a very conducive one, 
with all the players enough players that we don't have to depend uh, the players which is from overseas you know i still remember the days when we have this problem of uh pandemic the last two years what happened is the logistic just break down and when you are so dependent on uh, some components or raw materials from overseas and then when their company or organization are, are impacted the your delivery is also impacted here in malaysia but when you have everything the whole ecosystem within our own country then we we don't have to depend so much on overseas overseas uh, technology yeah so the idea is to build that very conducive and iot industry uh, ecosystem because there are many players inside here there's no single company can provide total end-to-end -to -end solutions i will tell you why because it comprises a lot of components inside there yeah secondly uh the technopreneurship, you know, uh, building the, the the capability for us to to produce new applications, new services, and then if the idea for us is to become a regional development hub, then we should become a producer nation. That that's the idea. So this is one of the uh, these are the three goals that we have made much earlier, but somehow along the way uh, we still have a lot of challenges in executing that initiative or activity or strategic uh, action plan yeah so to become produce, producer nation you know you have the market the market have a problem yeah? this these three components are very important when the market have a problem the 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 most close to the market is actually the industry the industry players people like yourself the smes you know exactly what the problem that they are facing and from there, if you don't have the capability to build your own R&D capability to build that solutions, you might outsource this to the, the, the university. The university have all the talents to do that. But unfortunately, the university unable to produce very complete uh, commercial product. They can most likely end at the stage of a lab prototype, what we call alpha prototype. But alpha prototype is not enough. You need to bring this prototype to the, to the field go to the real, real customers and have a feeling of what the customers would like to see. So that's why the industry have to bring these lab prototypes together with the university, show this and demonstrate this to the market that this product can make and can solve their problem. That product is what we call the beta prototype. So once they have given us the, 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 some ideas of how to improve it, then you can reiterate it. So you can go back to the universities, ask them that, you know, you can improve this new thing. So the idea of industry problem have to pass back to the university. Yeah. So once the market adopt our local industry product, then the industry can grow. They can sustain and the revenue that they will get, uh, gain from this uh, market will allow them to grow bigger and hire more people and getting more product, uh, more uh, innovators or you know people who can develop new technologies. Then the university graduates have a, have a place for them when they graduate. So that is why this, this the whole ecosystem is very important for us to, to, to make sure that it works nicely. Yeah? And then if you take a look at uh, the IoT, eh? IoT have this history, uh, maybe some of you knows about this but did you know that uh the, the 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 term iot internet of things have been coined by the father of iot himself kevin ashton he he worked in the proto and gamble he is an r d engineer over there he found out that there is this issue of monitoring the the, the number of assets from the the shops to the warehouse, for example, the, the lipsticks, how many boxes of the lipsticks are still available, which color are still in stock, you know, out of stock or whatever. So they have to, keep, to keep track of that assets. So the uh, the so when he founded uh, MIT in, in MIT, he found the MIT ID. So they, he 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 used the, the technology called RFID at that time. So using RFID, they have the capability to keep track of all the boxes, all the assets, all the things they call it. Yeah? So you can track it wherever they are. So you know exactly the, 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 the amount, the quantity and the whereabouts. So for there, uh, this idea of Internet of Things has been pitched out uh, by, by him and by, you know, now we, we, we are using that term Internet of Things. And this Internet of Things is 
actually it's not in 1999 that the real products that have been evolved actually much earlier even though they have not called it internet of things they call it connected coke machine for example in Carnegie Mellon in 1982 what happened is that David Nichols he's a student so with his friends he he developed a connected coke machine because he wants to know exactly if there's still coke inside there and still very cool you know so otherwise when they they come from the fourth floor and look at the coca-cola at the ground floor he found out that there's no coke anymore so he solved the problem by connecting the coke machine and there is a sensor inside there that detects is whether there is still how many coca-cola goes in and out from from that coke machine and then in 1990 john romke he's the first one that uh, designed the tcp ip uh, stack for ibm pc he designed something which is very fanciful, lah, internet toaster. The internet toaster when you can switch it on, you can switch off. But the idea is actually you, you can control devices like this through the internet. Yeah. So they at that time, uh, the, the, the term internet of things have not been coined. Yeah? But they, they just use what they call internet toaster, connected code machines and all that. So because of this this new technology as early as 1980s and 1990s we have seen that every new technology comes in it will always disrupt the whole organization you, you cannot run away if organization who don't want to adopt and embrace this new technology they will become obsolete so technology like this come sometimes comes at three years seven years you know cycle and you have to keep track of this new technology otherwise you yes we, we have seen that last, last 50 years ago the the 90 percent of the company is only uh, still in existence the rest of the company have obsolete because they didn't uh comp they didn't uh, you know uh, uh react fast enough in embracing this new technology so the idea for this if you look at r4.0 there are so many technologies is out there yeah it depends on which technology that you want to choose for you to enhance your business so if we take a look at this technology it doesn't come sometimes the technology comes is in single technology sometimes it comes in many technologies sometimes when it this technology this ripples of technology i call it it become a big fusion when it fuse together become wave a wave become bigger wave and suddenly become like a tsunami yeah so if you take a look for example this mobile technology from first generation up to the fifth generation mobile now it comes in cycle there is this technology cycle we call it the this generation uh, generations of mobile is actually a 10 year cycle so it will peak at the fifth year and will die down at the 10th year the first generation mobile is analog uh, you have to use modem to send your data but then in second generation is using digital so the moment when the first generation mobile is peak everyone is using that new technology comes in the digital comes in and try to replace that so when the second generation peak, the third generation mobile will come in. So the same thing, the cycle goes. So we are seeing now in the era where the five, fifth generation mobile is going to be introduced. It means that the fourth generation mobile is already at the peak, matured. Yeah. So once you have that, the fifth generation mobile will come in. So we are going to see this fifth generation mobile by the end of this year. So technologies like IoT is the same thing. IoT is not a single technology. It comes from different parts of the technology. It, it depends, for example, like the hardware in the electronics world, uh, the power or the computing power is becoming more powerful. The, the power in your smartphone is a similar, the same power that sent people to the moon. Yeah, now becoming very small into your smartphone. It's very becoming very cheaper, cheap and very, very small. Yeah. Connectivity, you know that now it's going to be everywhere. Everywhere you go, you can connect to internet from your home. When you go out, you go to what area network. And then software development. Oh, now it's very easy. Sometimes, sometimes even no coding application development. Yeah, without any codes, you can develop it. And then the number of transistors double electronic wise. When it doubles, the power of the computing is becoming double. Lah. Yeah. So every 18 months to 24 months, you will see this more slow coming in. And then we see the IoT ecosystem is growing and growing into a, a more mature with many more players coming in you will see that different components of iot the whole ecosystem from the hardware players to the software players are coming together yeah 
And then we are going to see that, you know, let's let's take a look and understand about, you know, take a step back and understand about uh, IoT itself. Is it so simple to understand it? Yes. If you take a look at in your business, the idea of, because people will say that, let's IoTize my company, let's embrace IoT, but what exactly do you want to do? Huh? So you get to take a step back and ask yourself, do you have an asset? Yes, you have an asset. Do you have a very expensive asset that you have difficulty to monitor from remote? If you have that kind of asset, then you have the capability to put IoT there. The assets, for example, like this, if the asset is your health, human have, you know, the health is actually an asset of any people. And you want to monitor either your asset, your health, or some people have, either your patient or your, your parents or whoever your loved ones that you want to monitor, their health and also their safety. So you can use a wearable device. So you have a wearable device with their GPS, you can monitor that from remote. You can monitor their blood pressure, heart rate, and so on and so forth. And then you have a bus, you have a vehicle that you want to know exactly where your vehicle is. You need to keep track of them, utilization of your vehicle. You have a car park, you know, you are the car park operator. You want to know the utilization of your car park. It's very important. Your consumption of your electricity in your house that you want to monitor, the security in your house that you want to monitor. And then sometimes the logistics about your, your, your goods that you want to send from one place to another place. You want to monitor temperature and humidity to make sure that the the goods and the fruits are vegetable are still fresh uh, the location of this vegetable where are they it's the same thing when you monitor your your lazada shopee purchases right so you need to know exactly where the delivery guys is actually uh, where they are but unfortunately what you're seeing on the mo the mobile app of uh, lazada or shopee uh, it's not real time yeah sometimes it just update sometimes it's not because it didn't keep track uh, all the time yeah so uh then you take a look at uh iot itself basically iot you need to understand that iot have these four layers yeah some people have five layers six, six seven layers it doesn't matter but basically it has four layers very simple to understand you need to know one component very critical is actually the sensors and then you must have connectivity yeah? you want to send the data out then you have the middleware how you aggregate the data and then you have the analytics the applications the the new workflow that you want to build, the insights that you want to derive, you know. So that is the more four main components. And this comprise of the whole IoT. As simple as the sensors. Sensors can be many things, you know. Humans have five sensors, the analog sensors, the sense of taste, touch, sight, smell, and also hear. But the moment you change your analog sensors that God gives us, it becomes digital sensors, becomes so many sensors. And so you can see sensors like acceleration, magnetic, uh, leaks, force, flow, chemical, you know, uh, acoustic, humidity, temperature, motion. These are all digital sensors. Yeah. Some people might say that a digital sensors and human analog sensors, which are better. Uh, sometimes people say is analog sensors are better. But analog sensors, people like us, if you are in a room, you cannot even tell me the temperature of the room, right? So the digital sensors will be able to tell you you are 25 degrees, your room is 20, temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. But human, they cannot quantify that. You only know it's warm, hot, or cold, uh, that's it. But digital sensors will tell you exactly where you are. For example, like GPS, your location is latitude, longitude, exactly where, the, where you are. But if your human sensors, you just mentioned that I'm somewhere near the traffic light or somewhere it's near the building A or B or C. Uh, that's how you uh, analog sensors you know differs again the digital sensors is very quantifiable yeah and then you have uh these sensors are uh, a lot uh, it's just uh, i'd like to show you to you that uh what kind of sensors out there can be used and then your phone is set uh, smartphone is uh, actually a sensors uh, the eyes being replaced by the camera the ears is actually the audio you know, the, the speed that you get from the phone is really the accelerometer. The location actually comes from the GPS. The movement X, Y, Z is actually the gyroscope. And the direction north, east, west, actually the compass sensor. You have the closeness. It can tell you whether you are near or very far, maybe through a proximity sensors. Ambient light tells you whether you are in the dark mode, in the, in, in, at night or at daytime. So these are 
sensors which is already built in into the your smartphone and there are so many sensors on inside the phone it can be like 18 20 sensors you you can check it out using your your android app utility you download the app and ask ask the app to tell you how many sensors in my in my phone and then you have connectivity so once you have the sensors the data that needs to be sent out how do you send it out it's either a fixed network or wireless network normally because your sensors on devices actually mobile sometimes it need just to use uh, by using a battery so it consume less power you might use technology like rfid nfc zigbee or even bluetooth yeah so uh, that is wireless technology so yeah, everywhere you go you you can still carry that device so just based on uh, based on a battery uh, sometimes you need to put into a battery power oh sorry uh, electrical power power outlet so your gateway might be connected to your normal uh, power at the power socket and all that but once you go out you need to be mobile too so you need to have a wide area network 3g 4g and 5g or you go to the jungle you might have your satellite so it depends on the coverage it depends on the capability of your devices you can choose the right network capability yeah so the so it depends so if you look at the table like this there are so many technologies don't worry about that but uh, you choose the right technology based on your application your application is very mobile your application need higher higher data to be transmitted your applications are very you know your location of your sensor are very far away so you have to choose the right the right uh, the right technology either you know uh, ymax or the rfid or bluetooth or even what we call six low pen okay six low pen something interesting six low pen means uh, uh oh sorry uh lp1 means low powered wireless area network this is meant exactly for internet of things initially when they design all this technology which 4g 4g 3g and all that it's not meant for small devices but now they have built a new network uh, which is categorized under lp1 low powered wireless area network it's low power and it can send the data very far away maybe it's very small packet size yeah so it's good for because sensors send very small amount of data so this technology categorized under lp1 uh, example is sigfox and lora they use unlicensed band unlicensed band mean the isn band lah. the 2.4 gigahertz which your wi-fi is using uh is sigfox and lora sigfox in malaysia is being operated by Experanti. Yeah. LoRa, you can you can deploy your own LoRa network uh, because you can use unlicensed band and you can set up your own infrastructure. And BIoT, oh, this one is meant for the telco. The telco like Maxis, DG, uh, you know, Cellcom and all that, they can use NBIoT. Telecom Malaysia, they can use NBIoT because it's licensed band. Yeah. So it's being uh, standardized by 3GPP. Like LoRa is the industry industry uh, initiative, right? the standards. So they have different capability. Which network that you want to choose based on that criteria that I show you just now? Either you want to look at the range, the coverage, the quality of service, the battery, where the deployment is, payload length, latency performance. Once we have chosen your applications based on that criteria, you can choose the right network. And then. I have to skip the third component, which is the middleware, which I will save later. The third component is actually the, the applications, the processes, that the, the thing that you want to derive the insects, insights. So once you have sent the data out to the platform, you have to take the data out and display something else. So or you can create a new applications. Applications can be many things. Anything that you can think of now, the data can be translated into smart logistic trans smart transport smart agriculture you name it because depending on the sensors that you, you you put in yeah so you can create more insights by having dashboards analytics you put machine learning you will learn of how the data behave and then you can make some prediction and so on and so forth so that is the the fourth layer where people will will uh, use it eh? so I, I will explain to you later of how you want to use this okay one interesting thing in the, about iot is that it actually is is the main core of ir 4.0 um, I, I heard that you you, you are well versed with the term in ir 4.0 but let, let me share with you again of how people perceive ir 4.0 it's just like 
looking at the big elephant and uh, everyone feels differently you know from the ears from the tail and all that from the leg they, they describe <laughs> the elephant in different way so the same thing with ir 4.0 people might describe it differently so let's take a look at how people describe it yeah first first the thing that you need to understand is that ir 4.0 that's a certain reason why they call it evolution or the word r there Revolution means very sudden and very destructive. So every industrial change happen is very revolutionized the whole business. And so it's a very big change. It's not evolution, it's very slow and gradual sort of thing. So otherwise we, we, we call it industrial evolution, lah, but now we are calling it industrial revolution. Yeah. So that's the idea. And then you know, initially when people coin it they didn't coin this the term ir 4.0 it's been coined by the the the, the german they, they 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 see that there is new technology that come in the emerging technology uh, which is going to fuse them together and disrupt the whole industry the manufacturing sector so they call it industry 4.0 once they coin the industry 4.0 then they <laughs> everyone is looking back the different industry revolution that happened you know the what happened so industry 1.0 is the days when the manufacturing sector is only in mechanization. You know, you use steam engine and all that, you know, manual. But the moment you introduce uh, electricity, so now you can you can generate better by, you know, you, you can uh, have mass production. Uh, machines are helping you. Uh, so using the electrical energy, no longer coal or steam engine. So in the 1969s and above, you see that in introduction of electronics, computers, databases, internets, and all that, that become the industry 3.0. But when the machines now, instead of just stand alone, now the machines having can be connected to internet. And that's why they call it cyber physical, where the, the, the physical world and the cyber world are merging together. So this is where the internet of things comes in. Yeah. So that is the world in the in the industry or the manufacturing sector. Then you have heard about society 5.0. Hey, what is that? Is it the same as industry 4.0, IR 4.0, or is it IR 5.0? So don't get confused. The society 5.0 is the term and being coined by the Japanese. The Japanese look at differently. They don't look at technology, but they look at how society being transformed. So when the era of society, which is hunting society, you have to hunt, that is the era of society 1.0. Yeah, you have to find your food. Society, when they based on agriculture, that is society 2.0. Then they have moved into become industrial society, the urban area, society 3.0. Society 4.0 is where the information society is. Internet has appeared, social media, website. So everything now, everything that we, we, we use now is actually on internet so you are seeking information by just browsing the internet and then you see that society 5.0 is a super smart society where artificial intelligence will be in iot inside there and so on and so forth what we are seeing is that instead of seeking for information the information will come to you that's the amazing part you know so i give an example you have made purchases in lazada shopee ebay amazon and all that by the end of the day, when you log in again, you'll see that there's some recommended things that the the, the marketplace uh, offer to you. Since you like to sh shop for bags, they will show you what are the bags available for you to purchase. Because it understands your profile, it understands your behavior. So it's very intelligent behind that. Yeah? So uh, that's, that's super smart society. So what about IR 4.0? So IR 4.0 is when uh, it not only cons, com, uh, confined to the area of uh, manufacturing only, but it goes to many sectors. It doesn't matter where you are, which industry you are. You can be in the textile industry, you can be in uh, agriculture, you can be in uh, healthcare, you can be in education. Uh, IR 4.0 can go across into many of these sector the way that we do business but uh, basically it's the same thing but i would like to describe it slightly differently so that you will understand where we are yeah so when we talk about ir 4.0 when we ask you are you in ir 4.0 then you will 
easily can tell you, <laughs> tell yourself that, hey, yes, I am or no, I'm not. So 1.0, if, if you're using manual and physical tools, yeah, using your hands and all that, some tools, physical, then your error of 1.0. Yeah. In 2.0, it's when electrical is being introduced. So your machines being assisted by electricity. In 3.0, uh, you have been using internet, database, computers, electronics, and all that, 3.0. In 4.0, all the new technologies that you're going to hear, uh, uh, hear now, it's just like IoT, blockchain, robotics, AR, VR. These are the new technologies which is within the IR 4.0. If you embrace that, you are in that era. Yeah. So, uh, World Economic Forum is one of the uh, organizations that define which technologies yeah, that comprise of uh, that that exist in the fourth industrial revolution or be used by in this uh, IR 4.0. So they, they have identified about 12. Maybe not all of them are related to us, depending on which country you are, depending on which economic sector that you are focusing on, it might be different. So they might focus on space technologies. They might focus on geoengineering. They might focus on energy storage transmission and all that. So they might have their own technologies, technology pillars, I would say. Yeah? And then Malaysia, you, you have heard about in 2018 when we launched Industry Forward, it is very much on manufacturing sector. So they have identified big data analytics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, addictive manufacturing or 3D printing, internet of things, autonomous robots, you know, uh, system integration is not technology, eh? cyber security. So these are the area of pillars of technology which industry forward uh, uh, focus on. But again, it doesn't stop you to go on other, other sectors. For example, when we work with construction, if you're in the construction business, how do you know that you're already in construction 4.0? If you are construction 4.0, means you are using some technologies which we identified here as the core technology for construction. We don't want to be very dependent on human power, you know, labor, so much on labor. Now you want to depend on technology to help you and reduce the cost of labor or make it more efficient, more productive, faster to market. Yeah. So they have prefabrication and modular construction. They have building information system. They have 3D scanning and photogram photogrammetry. So these are the, the new technologies that they have defined under construction 4.0. Of course, there are other technologies which are similar. You have going to hear again and again. They talk about blockchain. They talk about IoT. They talk about uh, robotics. They talk about... Uh, uh, 3D printing. Uh, these are technologies which are similar that goes across many sectors. Uh, so you can use it, but some they might define differently. So now the question is, which era of industrial revolution are we in? So if you are on the Facebook, maybe you can jot it down somewhere there. Uh, I'm looking at the Facebook whether you are tell uh, you can you can guess, take a guess whether which era of industrial revolution are we in, yeah? You can do it now. But while I'm talking, you will give another example. So I give an example since you, you, you don't know how to guess whether which, which revolution are we in now. Okay, the way that we cook, take a guess. In which era are we in? <laughs> I don't want to ask Padma. Padma, I already know about this so much. Okay, Padma. But okay, Padma. You, you mentioned that it's 2.7. <laughs> All right. The way that we cook, you know, if the way that we cook in the kampung is using coal and using this uh, uh, cutlery and all that, you know, that is still 1.0. Yeah. And then if you are using my oven, I'm sure some oven are just very easy for you just to change the temperature and <laughs> change the, the timer. That's electrical power. It's 2.0. Yeah. Then, if you want to, you if you want to use microwave oven, which is very computing power, electronic based, it can set you how to cook your soup, your cake, your your bakery, or your barbecue, different kind of meal. So maybe it's three point zero. But have you been cooking in the era of IR four point zero, which is three D printing example? You know, machines like this can print foods. Or you can use robot, become a chef, and it can become. Uh, and that is the era 
of where we we become the IR 4.0. Yeah. So the same thing like you you go to a restaurant, if they use a robot for you to serve you, maybe that is already now and embracing the IR 4.0 technology. Yeah. And then the way that we teach, are you an educator? If you you educate and you are teaching in your classroom, still using the blackboard, the whiteboard. And you are still in that era of old technology using physical too, right? And then if you are using OHP, you know, electrical power, uh, power projector, but it's still using uh, transparency, plastic and all that, it's 2.0. Using 3.0, when you're already online, webinar like this, using StreamYard, stream using uh, Facebook Live, streaming through YouTube and LinkedIn and so on, so forth. That's actually in 3.0. But are we teaching and using technologies in the era of 4.0? If you're using augmented reality, virtual reality, or you are using maybe uh, robots as your guest speaker, uh, that might be in 4.0. Eh? So no longer I'm going to teach you, but someone replacing me, which is a robot that, that you know, because I've been talking about the similar topic for the whole year. You know, I might just build a robot and talk about the same thing again and again, right? So whether it's going to replace me or not, uh, that depends on how intelligent the robot is. Lah. Okay, interesting. So the way that we transact, I'm sure that the way that you transact is through cash. You know, that is 1.0. Using some physical things and the way that you exchange money and people, the cashier, uh, you know, exchange your money, keep your money and using a cash register is 2.0, like a power. But once the cash machine is already online using credit card, E3.0. But 4.0 is when you're using e-wallet, you know, Apple Pay, you know, so using your watch to make the payment. So that is something is 4.0. And of course, in our our area, you might be using the, the, the 4.0 thing in transaction. So again, overall, again and again, we, we always uh, make an average, you know, are we 1.0? Yes, a lot of times we have been using 1.0 physical things. Are we using 4.0? Uh, sometimes. Are you still online? Yeah, sometimes. You know, remember when we are in pandemic, when everyone says that, hey, let's go teach, let's go and work from home. Not all of us have internet access. So the moment you have no internet access, don't call yourself in the era of 3.0. You are still at the 2.0 sort of thing. Yeah. So the moment you have three point, you the moment you have internet access, you are you are already three point zero. So in business, when we talk a lot, uh, we talk about the rest of the organizations and other businesses. They they are still like what Patma mentioned just now is two point seven. We are still two point seven, guys. Uh, how far are we towards moving towards four point zero? There's still a lot of gaps that needs to be addressed. So I think the first step is for us to get online. Oh, no, 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 not even online. The first steps for us to move away from 1.0 is making sure that everything goes digital. No more analog. No more papers that you need to sign. I still remember the days, even now, yeah, when you want to make any claim, you will receive an email with a PDF file. You have to print it out. You have to sign it with your pen and paper. You have to scan it back. You have to uh, send, send it through email and someone have to approve it. What? This is not really a 3.0. Is it like 1.0 using physical pen? Or is it 2.0? Or is it 3.0 on, online? When it's exactly online means the approval process, just click of a button, that's it. You have a digital signature. You don't need to have any physical things in between to, to do things. So that's totally 3.0. What more when we want to talk about approving your claims using artificial intelligence yeah, uh, or using blockchain? Hmm. So these are some of the new things that we need to think of. Okay. The interesting thing about IoT is that it can solve all the seven problems of the business. All the seven problems. If you guys have internal issues within your organizations, the SMEs, or you are the SMEs are the producers who wants to solve the problem of someone else you take a look at the seven business issues or uh, we address them as the seven m's yeah seven m of the business the first m is actually the manpower 
And you know that manpower is very critical. Do you want to reduce the manpower or you have to ensure that your manpower is more productive? So you can do things which monitored from remote rather than you have to send people to do a re remote meter monitoring you by physically to be there, you know, uh, by traveling cost is very high, accommodation cost is very high. Just looking at the assets from remote, what if you can put sensors that can monitor that easily? You can save hundreds of ringgit or thousands of ringgit per user per month. Yeah, that is simple like that. And you, you, you don't, it's very accurate. So you don't have to get more people to travel around the countries. Yeah, so you can lower the manpower cost. The second M is about material. You have a lot of assets that you want to monitor with, and you have a warehouse to ensure that your warehouse is always just in time sort of thing. You don't want to be overstocked or understocked, you know? So you have to know the location, the whereabouts of the assets. Where are they? Are they still at the port? Are they already going to arrive? So you have to make sure uh, you have to monitor them and the condition of the assets. Sometimes as simple as warehouse monitoring is the temperature and humidity condition to ensure that if anything goes wrong you know the temperature goes uh aircon is a problem it will spoil the whole warehouse yeah? very expensive so the same thing if you keep certain textile in your uh, your as your business you want to maintain the right temperature put a simple sensors there yeah and then the third m is actually uh the machine you have very expensive machines machines that you want to monitor to ensure the uptime is always there uh, the, it, it's not always idle you know if it's idling you might use the you can rent the machines for other things because 80 percent of the time is laying idle so you can make it money by renting the idle time yeah to others or if you look at the machines going to be you know so much have a problem uh, creating errors you can detect it you need to send for maintenance fourth m is the method you know that there's a lot of process in between as a, in the business and in between you see that there's a lot of these gates which human intervention come in they need to do some validation verification and sign off before you go send it to another place and again and again this process being repeated human come in place in between to verify validate certain things so that becomes very slow if the human is the main problem and leakages can happen you know uh, during that time so things can be transformed in between so you don't want that to happen but what if there are certain sensors you put id the moment it tracks it it will detect how many units out there the location and so on and so forth automatically uh, it will trigger uh, any alarms if anything's missing and so on and so forth yeah so method is something that can help and then you take a look at the the market that you have now if you are standalone machines that you have developed, it's only for local countries, but you have difficulty to monitor the machines that you sell somewhere very far away in, in, in country or even, even globally. But once we have that, assets can be monitored globally. It's easier for you to uh, uh, have a better customer relationship with your customers. Uh, you can tell them that you, they need some maintenance. If, even before your your customer call you up there is a problem so that that kind of situation can help a lot in your customer loyalty in terms of money of course money is a catching sort of thing where you feel that you know if your product is just a standalone it's just very limited in the sense of the features and the moment it puts on the internet you can create new business models you know you can have subscription base you can have outcome based business models and it saves a lot of cost lah, because uh, now no longer for you to to have customer service you know keep keep on uh, handling any complaint and so on and so forth and the business now becomes different you can differentiate yourself against your competitor yeah your competitor is still in the era of 3.0 or 2.0 you are now beyond that you're already in adopting 4.0 the seventh part is that uh look at the management wise data that have been coming in you need to help get the, the your management easy to to read the data uh, instead of you yourself have to create a uh, writing reports every week and you know, every month uh, to produce report it takes a long time for you to crunch the numbers but if it's automatically it can be real time and it can be very transparent you cannot change any data whatever data that comes in and out 
it displays. So it's very transparent. So the management will have a better insights of the data. So that are the seven M's that you can do in your business. So regardless of where you are, technology like IoT can play a big role. Yeah. So, uh, but again, there are these challenges that we are facing. Uh, good things plus versus the, ne the negative part where we have to resolve it. And I'm sure that you have heard about business case. People just don't know where to start. They know it's important, but just don't know where to start. Or what's the main problem they're going to solve? Is it productivity issue, productivity issues or is it something like uh, something that they need to do to, to increase their revenue or what? All the seven M's. Lah. So you have to define which M's out of the seven M's to be as your business case. And then you have to rethink back, but again, of how your, your process is going to be. So instead of 100 processes not being reduced to uh, 50 or 20 process. Yeah? And then the actions need to be take, you know, uh, to revamp. New new actions are need to be taken. Change management need to be happen. So the whole organization have to buy in. And meaning to say that the culture needs to be changed too. Uh, the culture of the era of 1.0, which is very physical, now no longer. So everything is digital. So computers is always in front of you. <laughs> so a mobile phone is a way for you to get access to data. And talents need to be reskilled. You have to unlearn the old thing. You have to relearn the new things. Yeah. And then you have to uh, ensure that because the data have to go across many departments, you have to ensure that the, dat the data can be shared among each other. New business model need to be formed. You know, and then finally, uh, you have you have to do some pilots yeah pilots is easier for you to get yourself uh get your project convinced by your your your, your management yeah. so that's the idea so uh, iot also also have this maturity level you know there are four uh, maturity levels okay uh one we call it uh very simple as monitor and then you put actuators you can control it and then thirdly you can optimize once you have more sensors and finally when you put intelligent in you can make it autonomous for example in vehicle industry you can put a gps to monitor your car yeah the location of your car by using an app have a gps and then uh, if someone st steal your car you can have a actuator to immobilize the engine control the engine stop it so you can have a car security and then if you have more sensors uh Put OBD too inside your car and can monitor all the temperature, fuel, tire, and all that. You can optimize your car way that you know you, you know the wear and tear of the car, so you can send for service maintenance. And fourth is when the car is so intelligent it can detect the objects, animals, or humans become autonomous. It can drive by itself, so without you driving. So that's the idea of IoT maturity. So we also need to understand that new project like this sometimes need to have trial trial because there are four main, four main reasons one reason is to ensure that the technology is mature enough yeah so when you you have a, a, a taxi which is flying and the battery that is carrying is under the taxi can last about 30 minutes ensure that it can last 30 minutes whether otherwise it's both you just flop, fly i know uh, drop down yeah? And then you have to see the market adoption. New technologies like this can be very skeptical for some people, how they want to adopt it, embrace it. You know, like a, a autonomous car, uh, whether you want to ride a vehicle which doesn't have any driver at all. You take a bus, no driver, no bus driver. Uh, it drives by itself to one place to another place. Do you feel scared or can you take that kind of vehicle? Are you safe? Okay. And then the business model needs to be changed. You know, sometimes you buy things previously, you might now subscribe thing, or it can be an outcome based, or it can be uh, also policy and regulatory matters. You need to understand new technologies like this. Our our government needs to change it, ensure that it can can help the local industry. Uh, remember the days when Gojek, Go sorry Gojek, uh, Digo, Digo is similar to Gojek. Yeah? Gojek is in Indonesia, so you have a motorcycle ride sharing. In Malaysia, they call it Digo. Digo fail at the early stage. The government don't allow them to operate their business. He said, uh, we, we, we cannot allow uh, the motorcycle to turn into a business where you can 
get passengers. <laughs> it's not meant for that purpose. Yeah. So they don't know which ministry have to actually uh, take care of that particular role. <laughs> yeah. Is it the, the multimedia or is it the transport <laughs> and all that? So, you know, this, this is an issue of regulatory issues. The same thing when you fly a drone, you need a, a drone pilot license. You know, so no one can simply just fly a drone. And there are certain places you can fly a drone, not near the electrical pylon, not even above Putrajaya, you know, it's a very secure place, not uh, above your houses, it's very uh, private, private place. So there are certain places that you need to fly drones. So when you have drones that can send parcels nowadays, you know, postal deliveries, so how does it react? The same thing when a car nowadays, when it doesn't have a steering, do you define that as a car? When a car doesn't have a steering and you also fly, do you consider that as an airplane or is it a helicopter or is it a car? <laughs> or it doesn't have a tire at all, but it can transport passengers. Is it a plane or is it a drone? So you don't know. So the, so the regulatory needs to be defined. So even though they like to, to ensure that the government to ensure the safety and security of the, the citizens, but they also cannot stifle the innovation of our country. So you startups, people like us who create new, new products have to also face this a lot of challenges when the country are very slow in responding into new regulatory. So that's why the government now have what we call the NTIS, the National Technology Innovation Sandbox. Something that you need the government to, to take a look at the, the regulatory issues you have to work on within that sandbox and they will help you in terms of any issues that you face, you know, whether is that regulatory or what. Okay, uh, this is the next phase of the presentation. Now you understand it's very important. It's not other questions of what is IoT. It's not, it's a question of when is it want to do it. But it's not now, it's not the question of when, you know that you want to do it now, but now the question is how we want to do it. Eh? So finally, is you have to turn that questions of from what to when and when to how. So this is how we do it. In order for us, if you are a startup or your SMEs that in within the business of IoT, you need to learn some uh, languages, which is very important. So the most important now uh, in all these languages, you like C, C++, if you want to design on the hardware, the devices, the gateways, you might also learn some Java and Python or C and C++. Or in cloud, you might be at a higher level or Java, JavaScript, Python, or PHP. Yeah? But if you learn these four languages, Java, Python, C, and C++, you might not run away from this, this top IoT programming languages, which is very popular nowadays. Yeah. So then you can work in many, many areas. So, and then as I mentioned just now, I've mentioned about the sensors, connectivity, and the applications. Now let's talk about the, the third part, the middleware. This middleware is the one that I mentioned to you about uh, Fabric. Eh? So I will share with you what we are doing so that you will know exactly why that element of middleware is also important. When you want to build an application, you also got to understand the data that you're going to own and you want to utilize it. So you have to understand this data is very key uh, because uh, the value of the data depends on the sensor that you, you put in place and the data that you require to bring into a higher layer what we call the value pyramid of the data yeah so the data if if the data is being produced by some individuals that that data is actually personal data so it's up to that personal individual individual whether to share or whether to make it private yeah uh, private data is organizations which is you know for their own purpose for their own consumption yeah? private organizations they build only for their own purposes Public is meant when the government is uh, putting up sensors like air quality index. You need to know that's your 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 pub, for public view. Water quality, you know, river level of water level of river and so on and so forth. Water quality. Yeah? Uh, that's why people say it's the taxpayers' money. You the public, the government needs to give that data back and showcase this to the end users. So that's why sometimes you see some of these that statistics. Is being shown in some of the local council or smart cities, their own dashboard. And then we have the commercial. If no one is building that, someone builds their own sensors, their own infrastructure. And when they create, the, when they generate the data or they, when they have acquired the data, they sell the data to you. 
because no one is uh, building that, they, they will sell the property. So the higher you go up to the, the whole value chain is where the money is. Yeah. So below is data is oil, black oil. You know, symbols, the digits, the bytes, the bits and the bytes. But it doesn't make any meaning unless you can turn the, the, the numbers into something more meaningful. You know, you can quite answer the question of who, what, where, and when. Then it becomes information, something more people would like to get. And then it goes higher. You can answer the questions of how you become knowledge. It goes higher up. You can answer the question of why. That is understanding. Because as a boss, as the, the, the company, as the CEO, he just want to know why my revenue is do, goes down by 10% this month. Yeah, my, why my revenue uh, last month is up by 20%. So you just want to know. So you have to go down in detail to dig out the who, the what, the where, and the when. So to do that, you have to find the right sensors. Sensors which like the ID sensors, the RFID, location sensors, GPS. You have to put temperature, humidity, pressure, you, you name it. Whatever sensors which is make meaningful to answer the questions of why it happened. So the levels of business intelligence is also differs depending on the, 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 the type of algorithm that you put in place. The more algorithm, the more machine learning that you put in place, the higher value it goes up, but it's more difficult. You know, when you go down at the very lower level, it's just descriptive analytics. It's all the historical data that you have seen is what happened, uh, things that you have already happened, that's it, it's a very discrete, it's a dash, normal dashboard. Diagnostic analytics is why did it happen. So you can dig down in detail and understand what's the problem of this data, abnormality, why it happened, you know, some, some threshold breaks down and on, so on, so on and so forth. What will happen is predictive analytics. We can forecast something which is not today, not what happened before, but it's going to happen tomorrow or in the future. And how can we make it happen? So you have prescriptive, you have all the data and make suggestion. Uh, you want to make, improve yourself. What are the changes that you want to make? So you can optimize the whole thing. It's a foresight sort of thing. Yeah. So in order for us to do that with all the data that comes in from many sources, you can comes from, you know, various sources. You have to blend the data together to make into something more meaningful. Yeah? The, the, if you have multiple sources of data that goes into different platforms, then you're going to have very difficulty to, to manage different data. So this platform is what we call the IoT platform that can blend different data together. So something that I'd like to share with you is our IoT platform called Fabric. Uh, Fabric is actually an IoT middleware. It sits in the cloud. Yeah? It's part of the, it's part within the cloud. Yeah? So to, to understand what's the difference between the middleware and the cloud, let me share with you this. If you have an IT organization, which is very, you have big resources, you have tons of money, you have all the people and the talent, you can have on the left side, which is traditional on-premise sort of thing. Everything is built inside. You manage it, the whole infrastructure from the network up to the server, to the OS, middleware, up to the data and applications. Yeah, you can have that. But sometimes people feel that, hey, I have problem in managing my network infrastructure. You cannot cater with the new, uh, technology, new speed, bandwidth that being required. I cannot cater to support the, you know, support with the new uh, powerful computer, computing power, storage, I need to increase. Too late, you know, very difficult for me to respond to my customer's demand. So I cannot scale up very fast. I need to request for budget. So by the end of the day, they said, okay, I outsource that level, which is the networking, storage, up to virtualization. This be managed by the vendors. So they put this in the cloud. So they call it infrastructure as a service, IaaS. So infrastructure is a service where you allow the whole infrastructure to be owned by the, 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 the providers, but you own the OS, middleware, data, and applications. But in the case where you also don't want to think about, you know, what the middleware want to do, how to manage the devices and all that, the runtime, the OS and all that. You only want to think about, hey, my application is on top of this, my data is on top of this, then it becomes platform as a service. So platform is a service where favorite is. So we, we allow you to own your applications and your data. We manage everything down there. Yeah. So if your software as a service, everything now is in, in the cloud. Lah. Meaning to say like Amit is in everything in the cloud. You don't build your applications like Amit or Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom or Gmail, for example, Google Calendar. 
it's all service software as a service yeah so when we talk about platforms there are so many platforms out there you know they can be like publicly traded platforms these are big companies amazon google ibm they are big organizations very complete ecosystem very good tools but quite expensive yeah and then you have open source open source is the one that by developed by the whole community managed by them and you have to you have to get the support from them to to post when you want to um, put into your your own infrastructure but then also you have end-to-end -end connectivity these are the hardware players they design their hardware they design their platform around the hardware and but they don't want to share this uh, platform to others so it's quite close in the sense uh, sometimes they say okay this is only meant my platform is only meant for my infrastructure and my solutions they have very end-to-end -end, uh, so they don't want to share that but there's another fourth category is developer friendly platform you can connect to any applications you can connect to any platform you can connect to any hardware so people like us fabulous carriers and some some others are the developer friendly platform so this is a platform that we have uh, you can connect whatever sensors down there you can start off very simple uh, education kit from raspberry pi arduino to be connected or you can have commercial devices connected directly to a gateway or through another LoRa or whatever sensors that have that. You can connect using Co-app, REST, or MQTT. Yeah? So from there, the, the platform will manage your devices easily. Onboarding can be very easy, and uh, manage the devices also can be very easy. So then another way is also they allow you to extract the data out for you to uh, create your own dashboard, or you can use the internal dashboard that we have built in yeah so that's one of the things that you can do so the idea is to rapidly develop your it solutions you don't have to think about months so you can reduce into weeks weeks into days we have a friendly apis we have a community we have tutorials uh, documentation uh, source code examples that you can use it yeah support many uh, uh, many hardware out there so this is how you can log in and uh, so it's a very simple one so now I'm giving this opportunity uh, just a little bit for two or three minutes for you to do this contest. So what I will do is that I'm giving out uh, three vouchers, 100% voucher for free uh, for free beginner plan. Each voucher cost, uh, each voucher is actually worth 100 ringgit. What you need to do is that you have to log into this platform, register as a free user. If you already become already a valid user, you can use another email address. Lah, eh? So try try out this one. So if I have the numbers, the the, num the winners will be from the the winners actually number one. If you are slightly late, number ten will win. If you are slightly more late, you will get number twentieth. Macam cabut number tua lah. So number one, number ten, and the twentieth. But if I don't get the number up to twenty, then I'll just give to, from one to ten only. If I don't get the ten numbers, I just give number one only. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, take a very short time because it's just a very few minutes. People can register this as easy as like less than three minutes to do that. Okay. So I'll I'll take a look at how uh, it works. Okay, and see how many of you have registered. So I have a colleague who will tell me if there is already people who have registered to this platform. Yeah. So the the. So this platform is have different capability uh, because uh, not different capability, different pricing strategy. Just I'd like to share with you is that a free user have its own uh, capability, and then you have the 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 beginner plan, which is higher capability. Uh, okay, for example, uh, for example if you are free users it's only limited to you to uh, to connect up to three devices only but and also you have five, 500 api meaning you can send data 100 times a day or if every minute you use one api one data then 500 minutes just finish off so if it's not enough you have to upgrade that into a beginner plan which is the one that i'm i'm, I'm sharing with you that 5000 api per day is enough for you to send every minute data yeah so you can connect to unlimited number of devices the beginner plan also offer you uh, some basic analysis and also unlimited number of dashboard that you can create so you can create different dashboard with a lot more widgets being given and you can even share your data 
uh, your your dashboard to a public. Yeah, you can even extract your data out, and then you have also a Telegram features. So that is built in into a uh, beginner plan. So hundred ringgit per year, or you can if you are a serious developer, you can upgrade to a developer account which have more features there. So you can go to the website. Uh, as I mentioned to you, this website, and also you can check out some of the details of the the, the, the platform and their their uh, their pricing and all that. Yeah. So these are some of the examples. Eh? So I have about fifteen more minutes, but uh, let me just quickly go through uh, the the slides before we open up to question and answers. So these are the slides. Once you log in, you will see that these are the the hierarchy that you want to see the projects. Uh, that you have created and the data streams that being 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 generated by the devices. Okay? So Fabric create a hierarchy like this. So you have a project, you can have multiple projects and multiple applications under that project, and each application can have their own group, and you can have devices connected to that group. So an example, you have a project like Smart City is a big project. You have many applications under Smart City, and then like for example. Uh, river quality and lake quality are two different groups and they have devices connected to that. Smart parking have different location, parking A, parking B, and different devices connected to that. Yeah. So the data streams can be streamed. You can see the data that goes in and out of the platform. This is what the data has been captured. Uh, you can see real time. Uh, you can see the dashboard that you can create. As I mentioned, if you are a beginner account, you can have much, uh, a lot more dashboard, unlimited. Uh, you can have custom customize your dashboard with widgets that have been built in into the platform yeah you can see different widgets that can show you depending on the data that you are generating creating uh, so this some of the graphs the graphs can be built within the platform for free but in order for you to make it public there is a public url that you can make it public you can generate it and you can share this public url where you can view this on your a separate computer so using a just normal website you give a url you can view that as public so you can view either through uh, the, your own dashboard you can extract the data using json or C csv file you can create your own uh, spreadsheet uh, using your excel spreadsheet to do your own graph or you can use other step-by-step -step tutorials that we have shown here using mit app inventor you have used plotly you can use chart.js this can be tried, yeah. So you can use these are some of the community members who have helped us in terms of building some step to step tutorial. You can start off your journey. You can share your portfolio too, all the success story that you have built, some projects you have built in, built using Fabric. You can share with your members, so the members will see at this Fabric website. So all these uh, players are the members, so that they can contact you directly. So a, a place where you can share your 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 story, yeah. So tutorials are there, uh, it's built bit in here, or you can go in even to the favorite tutorial. Yeah, the tutorial is out there, uh, favorite tutorial channel, uh, all the experiments, and even the how to use the favorite platform. Hmm? So how do you want to solve the IoT puzzle? It's quite simple. You go and find the development board, which is easy for you to use. Yeah? There are many out there. And then you can find the right sensors. To be connected yeah. or you can find uh, one that we have worked together like high discus the malaysian iot kit and so it has a built-in sensors inside there like a barometer humidity temperature altitude is also inside there so you can connect through a, a bluetooth or even wi-fi and from there you can send the data out to favorite platform so there are tips and tutorials for for this purpose that you can can use it so instead of months even a two-hour tutorial session you can start your IoT journey very fast. So if you are serious enough, you can build these applications for, for example, like Tracker Batch. You put in GPS, you put in ID, you can create applications for many vertical markets. Yeah, you can detect your whether you are no movement, man down detection, SOF alarm. So with the press of button, you can do many many applications. I give an example, the one that I work with, Apartma uh, from uh, Creo IT. So what we have done is that. They have the issue in this campus where the, the buildings are, have their own uh, network hubs. Whenever the network is down, the customer complain, is it an IT problem? But the IT people say it's not their problem, it's the power problem. So it's the facility should manage that. So instead of everyone is pointing problem to each other, 
So we have this system up and running where any it detects the the power source. If there is any power failure, it will it has its own battery. It will send the data out through uh, through internet and it send the data to the telegram. So when the power is restored, you also immediately see the message. So both party will know whether it's a power problem or is whether it's a IT problem. So it's quite simple uh, application scenario. So now we are proud to see that we have more than 5,000 people uh, becoming a subscriber from around more than 100 countries around the world. So I suggest you to become the, 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 the players for this. And uh, I'm not sure how many have been using this, but I can see some of you have registered. And uh, so not many, I think during the afternoon, <laughs> not many of them. I can only see one person. Uh, so don't even get... Uh, the numbers up to 10 so i have only one one winner here for announcement i will announce you later okay okay and then the interesting thing is about iot is that it's very disruptive but uh, everything when whenever it's very disruptive it doesn't have a traction it will go down to the chasm and it will die off until someone really found out that this really solved their problem and become an early majority so you don't want to become late in the market to become the laggards so a lot of technology either the innovators will fail or you become the user and the user become too late uh, using the technology yeah? so the idea is this simple the applications needs to start off with a very small and very focused uh, problem statement once you have that you can have a buy-in now you can later you can integrate with the current legacy system and then you have more you can scale up you can have more data you can have more workflow business models and better analytics for you to start off so finally, uh, I would like to share with you guys, if you have time, you can download this uh, free IoT ebooks, which I've written. Uh, one book is about the IO IoT journey, of how you want to start your journey building your IoT solutions. And secondly, about uh, for a lecture, lecture notes, some notes about uh, IoT itself. Yeah. So uh, what I will do is that I will, before, uh, after the end of the presentation, I'll give you the link of the slides that you can download it eh? you uh, check out at the Facebook slides at Facebook uh, comments. I will put that into the, the comment side so you can download all of this material. No problem. OK, lastly, I think since uh, not many of you might uh, are here during this afternoon, I still want to give out this thing. It's a limited offer. So instead of 100 percent, I will give the, 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 the 50 percent. So it's only 50 ringgit per year that for one year uh, using the voucher code and this voucher code is only valid for one week today until 18 of October uh, only available for 20 voucher units so I think with that I would like to end my presentation thank you very much I will pass back to Bhuvna because we have about more about, about 10 minutes for question and answers right thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Maslan. This is really a very good informative um, information about uh, the, I would say like it's uh, as someone who don't know anything about IoT, at least they know that where to start, right? So uh, maybe you have opened a little bit on the blindfolded, but I still see SMEs are very much clueless on how they can bring into their uh, industry. So the IoT practices. So I see like, what we can do is that we can share about the IoT resources that you have shared in your YouTube channel. I hope like that will help our members and also audience to have more information about the fundamental where they can find out about IoT. And one thing that I see from your conversation is that if you want to scale up yourself, you want to see a different, uh, I mean, a level in terms of the industry 4.0. We were talking about it. You've given us the examples. Are you in 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 in a different, different angle in our daily activities? So that is really attracted me. So without further ado, I hope like we can go on the questions has been asked. So we have some limited questions and uh, we have your co-partners over here. Mr. Patma has asked a question. Maybe you mm. want to address the question from Patma. Is it like the local IoT sensor design company face challenges from imported IoT sensor when it comes to the cost? How we can overcome this and become a producer nation? 
So it's something like uh, related to IoT community, the developer community. Maybe uh, doctor can give uh, your opinion about it. Yeah, I think it's all about volume, Pak Ma. I'm sure you know that uh, volume plays a big role in terms of this. So volume will only start when we ourselves understand that uh, if we can support the local company. By, by having that kind of volume, it's either uh, the cost can be reduced, you know, or another part is that instead of cost, then we, if you take a look at IoT, doesn't mean that it's only components like hardware uh, devices. Hardware components can be a small amount or fraction of the total solution. But when you bundle up with the total solutions uh, as a solutions provider, you can make up or make up with the, the, the cost that you, you are not able to, uh, you know, uh, to reduce by having, you know, gain your revenue comes from other part of the total solution. So that's why I think we, 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 we need together in the whole ecosystem to understand uh, how we play a, a role inside this, uh, how we can, you know, uh, uh, share our, 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 uh, our strength together and leverage our strength in providing end-to-end -end solutions. You know, you might be good in this area, might be in this area, but in total, if we go together as a project, it might be slightly different. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. And also, uh, there is another, uh, I mean, a question from Zen Chu. So he said, like, it's a very informative uh, sharing. Yes, I, I so much agree to that. And also, he said, like, he would like to know if there is an incentive or grant from a uh, Malaysian government to support the business transformation. So I hope, like, uh, this is also can be addressed. So my previous uh, thing, uh, thought on this IoT is that is there any specific IoT advisory panel under any of our government agency, it could be from MIMOS or under uh, MOSFI. Is there anything that uh, SMEs can actually go and check it out? Okay, there are several uh, areas grant or incentive that you can get. One is, as you know, there is industry forward grant. So industry forward have this intervention grant. You know, you have a, you, you need to do a readiness assessment. The, the customer need to have readiness assessment. And then you will have this uh, grant provided to you if you are eligible. So it's a matching grant. So it will relieve the, the, the cost from the, the, the client uh, to uplift their operations into IR 4.0 or anything on IoT. And then there's a grant on NTIS. You know, it comes from 250,000 up to one, I'm not sure, 500,000 or whatever. So you can also apply that grant. Uh, it will help you in terms of of testing out, trialing out your, your product. And there's also a grant from Mosti, what we call Idana. Uh, Idana grant, there is a different kind of grants for startups, you know, as small as from 500,000 up to millions of ringgit. So it depends on the, the this grant depends on the status of your R&D, whether you are still at the lab stage or you are now moving towards the field stage where you are trialing out with the actual customer or you are now at the stage of want to go beyond the, you know, making sure that your, your standards are there, optimization and, you know, it's more on pre-commercialization. And then they also grant from MTDC and MEDEC and all that, they, they, they match the grant between, uh, uh, between the technology providers and also from the, 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 the end users, but the grant is not big, maybe about 25K and all that. So, but there are bigger grants, if you are, you you have that so in terms of who are the people that manage the the the, the blueprint you will see that last time it's mostly for the iot national iot framework but i, I think with the R, R, rmk12 we are trying to re revisit back the whole uh whole uh, uh national iot strategy framework but there are also initiatives which is being run through my digital and also the 4ir strategy hopefully they put some run there lah, yeah but I haven't seen that, that grant under that blueprint at the moment. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maslan. So uh, I had one question, as I told you, like, is there any advisory or a panel or agency that we particularly can check out on knowing the, um, like what you say, like about the national uh, strategy roadmap for IoT? Uh, is there any specific uh, site that we can refer to for SMEs? Uh, okay. At the moment, we don't have that. 
us from the ministry level. Initially, when they start off with the national IT strategic roadmap, that should be the case. But unfortunately, uh, the initiative just uh, died down. So it doesn't have that uh, national level. But of course, I think we shouldn't depend so much on the industrial, uh, the national level, but we should depend on uh, association. For example, my IOTA, the one that myself and Pakma is already in, the my Malaysia IoT Association. So these are the industry voice. You know, they, they, they can provide a platform for us to share our ideas and thoughts and if there is any any requirement or any uh, recommendation that we can put forth to the government, that we can put forth towards that. So that is Malaysia IoT Association, and there is some organizations on fourth industrial revolution, but that covers a lot more technologies rather than just IoT. But the one I mentioned just now is the My IOTA is very specific and focused on IoT. So that is industry-based platform. Yeah. Now and of course there are some other uh unofficial platform that i have generated and you know create that the whatsapp group where people can share their, their own <laughs> initiative there okay but it's not some a word from the government lah. it's only for the industry so it says again we, we put it this as a kita jaga kita so the association can be a channel for any SMEs who want to know uh, how they can actually bring up uh, the IoT adaptations into their business as an organization. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Maslan. It has been a very informative uh, uh, content that you have uh, given, to, uh, given to us and also you have uh, shared the uh, slides. And we are so happy to have you today. Uh, so on behalf of Kuala Lumpur and Slango Indian Chamber of Commerce, Thank you so much uh, to you and also all the audience who supported this uh, 40th online series session by Cal uh, So our motive is that to bring more awareness on Industry 4.0 adaptations among SMEs, startups and uh, small business owners, whoever want to, to scale up their businesses.